Chopin and I go back a very long way. We first met each other on the Rajdhani from Calcutta to Delhi as we were both heading for history degrees at St. Stephen's College. And that was, I'm embarrassed to say, almost 47 years ago. So uh, our paths have crossed and our swords have crossed on many occasions since. Chopin is uh, nominated to the Rajya Sabha by the BJP. And when I first knew him, he was a Trotskyite, so he's made a long journey uh, to the other side of the political fence. Um, and I, I would, I think, honestly say that he's one of the more articulate, readable, and perceptive voices, and there aren't too many of them, on the right side of the, the right wing side of the spectrum. Uh, my excuse, as it were, for talking about this today is that Penguin recently reissued my 2003 biography, Nehru, The Invention of India. Uh, with a new introduction, essentially, I haven't changed a word of the text of the book, but just pointing out how much more urgent was the need to keep evaluating Nehru's legacy at a time when everything he stood for, represented and advocated is so fundamentally contested by the powers that be. The question that the organizers asked us is, what did Nehru do right? And I think the answer to me is pretty obvious. It may be less obvious to others. But I would say, first of all, that um, we owe in very great measure the building up and preservation of our democratic institutions to Nehru. The reason I make that argument is that he came to the prime ministership at a time of great national torment, partition, the flames of partition blazing across the land, the, um, the uh, 13 million people displaced in one direction or the other, the 1 million people killed, the billions of rupees of property damage. There was so much chaos and disorder that he could easily have been tempted to say we need a firm hand to be able to keep law and order. He didn't. He continued on the path of democratic institution building, insisted on free and fair elections with universal franchise. The only previous elections the British had held um, uh, gave the vote to one out of every 40 Indians. So uh, we were really in, we're making a major leap into the unknown. Within a few months, Mahatma Gandhi was assassinated. Within two years, Sardar Patel had passed away three years. And there was simply no one of comparable stature to challenge Nehru's authority in the country. He could have easily been tempted to go the way of so many other leaders of developing countries in Krumah, in Ghana, Nairere, in Tanzania, Kaunda, and Zambia, who argued that authoritarian rule was indispensable for them in order to keep national unity together and direct development. He never succumbed to that temptation. This is the man who at the crest of his rise, at the peak of his popularity in the 36-37 polls, actually authored an anonymous attack upon himself, saying that Nehru is getting too many delusions, he's swayed by the crowds, we want no Caesars. And it was only months later that it turned out that the author of this article in the Modern Review of Calcutta was Nehru himself. And the message he wished to convey was individuals should not be exalted, institutions must be. And in his conduct of the prime ministership, he did this consistently. He showed enormous respect for parliament despite the numerically tiny opposition, gave them an importance out of all proportion to their numbers, encouraged his own MPs to challenge him as many did on many occasions, uh, including his own son-in-law who brought down a finance minister in Nehru's government, no less, um, from the back benches of, of the ruling party. He showed a great deal of deference in protocol terms to the president and the vice president, though he was far more powerful than them in the Indian polity. Um, he showed a, a, a tremendous respect for the judiciary. It's very interesting. One occasion, he was a short-tempered man. He lost his temper and said something absolutely intemperate at a press conference. By the end of the day, he had written an abject letter of apology to the judge in question. And then he wrote a groveling letter to the Chief Justice of India, additionally apologizing for having insulted the judiciary. And these letters were made public because the idea was to convey to the nation that not even the Prime Minister of India has the right to insult the judiciary. 
This is the kind of Stalin. Whenever he was crossed in the cabinet, whenever people disagreed with him, his instinct was not to blunderbuss his way through, but to offer his resignation. Of course, that was often enough to, to, to uh, get the cabinet to go along with him, but that was the instinct of a democrat, not of a tyrant. So I would say those first 17 years, instilling all these habits, practices, and institutions, gave us the foundation for the democracy that eventually has led to a person of very humble origins being able to rise to the highest and most powerful office in the land. The other major contributions of Nehru undoubtedly were his, for lack of a better word, secularism. I say lack of a better word because um, in many ways India is not secular in the Western dictionary sense of the term. Nehruvian India actually encouraged a proliferation of religions, respected them all, in, aided many of them, but in no case was one privileged over the others by the state. And I think that kept a very diverse nation together, particularly helping the wounds of partition to heal. On economics, there's legitimate ground for disagreement, and I might find myself somewhat in sympathy with some of Chopin's critiques on, on socialist economics. But if I were to plead the case for Nehru's economics, it would be that at a time when fresh after independence, the country was not exactly awash with capital, he helped the state build up, again, a basic infrastructure, most notably something we should appreciate today, the infrastructure of scientific and technological excellence, the IITs, the engineering colleges, um, the steel plants, and so on, uh, the institutes for research and science, all of which gave us the basics uh, that ended up with Indians conquering Silicon Valley and becoming reputed around the world as, as computer geeks and, and software wizards. And then finally, the fourth pillar of Nehru would be uh, his foreign policy, where he gave India, again, an importance on the world stage out of all proportion to its relatively weak military and economic power by articulating a vision that rose above the binary divisions of the Cold War. Um, uh, it became known as non-alignment, but rather like non-violence. It meant more than that it was, it was negating. And he managed to bring together, therefore, for India, uh, opportunities for tremendous influence in global affairs, as well as a certain amount of leverage with both superpowers in the Cold War. So these are the four things I would give as my answer to the question asked by the organizers. Democracy, secularism or pluralism, uh, the building up of basic economic infrastructure uh, and scientific and technological infrastructure, and um, the, uh, the, the place of India on the world stage. So I'm going to pause there and ask Chopin, I don't know if his mic is working or he needs to borrow this one too, to refute it. Try. Well, thank you very much, Shashi. It is working. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much, Shashi, and thank you for that very generous introduction, which dates back to the time we traveled at the Rajdhani Express in uh, the early part of in the middle part of 1972, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I think he's right. We both have traveled a very long way, politically and otherwise. I recall a fellow student who was a great admirer of the Swatantra Party. That's me. <laughs> Just for the record. Swatantra Party. Which, I still admire it greatly. Uh, which, of course, was Rajaji, as you well know, was very committed to his battle against any form of dynastic rule. Maybe Rajaji was wrong in that sense. No, in, I think Nehru would have agreed with him on we, dynasty. We'll, uh, we, we, can, uh, we, we needn't go over. We need, this is not a session in archaeology. <laughs> I think we'll, re, we'll leave our misdeeds of the past uh, for another day. Uh, I think th th this is an interesting debate. It's not a debate in counterfactual history. And I think let's be very clear. I know there are a lot of people, particularly people who belong to my side of the ideological persuasion, who Shashi very kindly, cryptically would have us believe is the stupid party. I don't think I've ever used that word, by the way. This is Chopin's paraphrasing. People who lack the refinement, the cosmopolitan outlook, 
which is so, uh, which belongs entirely to one side of the political divide. But it's not an exercise in counterfactual history. It's not a question of what would have happened had Mahatma Gandhi lived another five years. What would have happened had, had the Congress Working Committee resolution on Sardar Patel been adopted and actually Patel been made prime minister. These are ifs and buts of history and we can go on and on about it. Nehru became the prime minister in 1947 and governed till 1964, till his death. Nehru's contribution as the first prime minister of the country is immeasurable. And I think anyone who contests the fact that Nehru had a very significant role to play in the establishment, the consolidation of Indian democracy would be wrong. I don't think these are matters of contestation. Today, Shashi is entirely right. There are facets of Nehru which have been called into question. Whether they are facets of Nehru or the interpretation of Nehru as posited by the Nehruvians is of course a matter which we can discuss at length. I don't think the issue of democracy is being contested. I don't think that is at stake at all. We can talk about Nehru, the man who contributed a lot as leader of the Congress party, which was undoubtedly the biggest party, in fact the predominant party, the dominant party in India. It was not Nehru's impulses alone which led to the constitution. It wasn't Nehru's impulses alone which led to democracy. There was a certain mood in the country. It was backed up by the legacy of the freedom movement of what people believed in it. And the Congress party was not entirely Nehru. Nehru was no doubt a very principal and a very forceful figure in that. But there were other forces which were there. And it was, to a very large extent, a form of rainbow coalition, a broad-based party, which contained diverse impulses, which may strike us as odd in today's climate, where political parties have, t have tended to become far more regimented and believe in only one particular line, which I think is a larger shortcoming of Indian democracy, and it's not something which is limited only to the Congress party. The aspect of Nehru, which is really contested today, is on the question of what is the identity of India. And it is a, 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 an issue on which it's not the Nehruvian legacy, but what did Nehru personally believe? I think that is often the issue. There is a difference between Nehru, the public man, the prime minister of India, and what Nehru believed personally. And we are fortunate that he was a prolific writer. He wrote a lot of letters, the entire correspondence of Jawaharlal Nehru, very, very revealing, and tells us quite a lot about what Nehru believed, what he didn't believe, what are, what are his. And I think, I'll just quote to you two Passes, uh, two aspects of it, and I just made sure I just got it. One was at the opening of the High Court in Chandigarh, it was somewhere in the 56 or 55. I'm, I'm, I'm. And Chandigarh was a new city designed by La Corbusier, who Nehru had personally selected. Those were not the days of L1s and uh, <laughs> you know people. You know Nehru had certain profound likes and dislikes, and he believed that India should accept his likes and dislikes as part of policy. Therefore, in 1946, for instance, he abandoned the dhoti and decided to wear the churidar. So that became the national dress of India. There wasn't a discussion about it. There wasn't a public tender about it. The Constituent Assembly didn't discuss it. It was an error. So likewise, Lord Corbusier was appointed. And at the opening of the High Court in Chandigarh, 
he made a very, very interesting speech, which is contained in case you're thinking I'm, this is part of fake news, volume 28, page 26 of the selected works of Jawaharlal Nehru. I assure you, whatever I quote from him can be duly authenticated. And he said, I'm very happy that the people of Punjab did not make the mistake of putting some old city as their new capital. It would have been a great mistake and foolishness it is not merely a question of buildings. If you had chosen an old city as the capital, Punjab would have become a mentally stagnant, backward state. It may have made some progress with great effort, but it could not have taken a grand step forward. In other words, the old must somehow be obliterated and eased out. I would think obliterated would be too crude a man for an esthete like Nehru to believe. It would be eased out. And it would be replaced by a new India, which would have only a tenuous connection with what went on in the past. And I think that's really the whole issue. And that's not the only time. In a letter to uh, in, in a letter to Kailashnath Kadju, person your somewhat familiar with, and I quote again here. My children's great-grandfather. Yeah, exactly. And he wrote this. What real Hinduism may be is a matter for each individual Hindu to decide. Fair enough. We can only take it as practiced. In practice, the Hindu is certainly not tolerant and is more narrow-minded than almost any person in any other country except the Jew. <laughs> it does not help much to talk of Hindu philosophy, which is magnificent. The fate of India is largely tied up with the Hindu outlook. If the present Hindu outlook does not change radically, I'm quite sure that India is doomed. 1953, November 17th. Between these two, what are we to make out? That here was a man who believed his form of secularism was one where the past inheritance would somehow be rubbed off, be erased, and it would be taken by something which today we call constitutional patriotism. It's a German expression because the Germans were very keen after 1945 that their troubled history should somehow be erased and it should be replaced by some new form of identity which would be called constitutional patriotism. The point is India as a nation wasn't born in 1947. India as a republican state was certainly born on 26 January 1950. But India as a nation, India as a civilization was not born at all. And Nehru's problem and the problem of Nehruvians subsequently is that they believed that somehow the past must be taken away. Okay, this is where and I And this to... is where, and the contests took place over Somnath with K.M. Munshi, very famous correspondence. I would urge all of you, if you can, to read it. Not necessarily because you need to agree with what Mun Munshi said, because I think it's, it's very revealing. His disagreements with Dr. Rajendra Prasad, who, if, Dr., uh, if Sarvapali Gopal is to be believed, Nehru thought of as having the mind of a 19th century man. So we can go on and on and on about the, these things. But the point is, and I, and I want to just end this, and I want to end this with a quote from Gopal about how Gopal, and I think Gopal's three-volume biography, I think the nearest we can come to is what is called an authorized biography of Six Gopal. Six volumes. Well, it depends three, on the three volumes. Three volumes. Three volumes of Gopal's written. biography. And I think Gopal sums it up. And he said, in the Nehruvian worldview, the problem of minorities was basically one for the majority community to handle. 
the test of success was not what the Hindus thought, but how Muslims and other communities felt. And I think this is it. There was an underlying disdain for what might be called, today you may call majority sentiment, you might call majoritarian sentiment, whatever it is. But at the heart, the soul of India was interpreted by Nehru in a way which differed from the impulses which were then in existence. And I think those contradictions at that time did not surface, partly because of the personality of Nehru, partly because of the political conditions that prevailed and have surfaced subsequently when, of course, the dominance of the Congress party is no longer as unquestioned as it was then. Thank okay, you. well, this is a very important critique and I'm going to respond to it. But before that, let me make a brief response to your dig about dynasty at the very beginning. Fact is that Nehru was no dynast. Uh, not only... But Nehruvians are. That's a different matter. He at no I, stage did anything to encourage any member of his family. When Mrs. Gandhi was made president of the Congress party for one year, it was a mutual agreement that she did not seek re-election, though there was a predictable clamor for it in 59-60. And then he was actually interviewed on the subject because as he got older, there were things like Wellis Hangen's famous book after Nehru Who, a lot of articles speculating about the future. And he was asked whether he would like his daughter to succeed him and he reacted with asperity to an American editor and said, I can't rule from beyond the grave. And they, he was very, very blunt about it. He said, my entire achievement, uh, what I hope to leave behind, and he was asked what he hoped his legacy would be, was, I hope, he said, 300 million people capable of ruling themselves. That was the population of India at the time he gave very, the interview. Very, I think that's a very important clarification, Shashi, because I think it also points out how the Nehruvians of today have been unfaithful to the legacy of Jawaharlal. You can put it that way if you wish. Uh, but but I, I, think, I think the main point is, the question is, what did Nehru do right? This is not something he did wrong. But I think Chopin has made a more far-reaching critique than needs answer, which is his argument that Nehru disdained the past of India, that he uh, had no respect for the Hindu majority, its faith and its beliefs. Now, I'm afraid this is completely inaccurate because it's out of context. Not because the quotations are wrong, but because they've been snatched away from the overall body of Nehru's work. Nehru's appreciation for India's past, its ancient culture, history, religion, is manifest in two different works, Glimpses of World History and, and Discovery of India. And it is implicit in much of what he writes about his upbringing in his autobiography. This is not somebody who is insensible Far from it. He was very conscious of the great culture of India. He interpreted it in syncretic terms. He saw particularly North India's Ganga Jamni Tehzeev, this, uh, this intermingling of Hindu and Muslim influences as fundamental to who he was. And in fact, um, the letter that um, Chopin uh, refers to was a letter written to Kailashnath Karju during the unsuccessful attempts at that point to promote the Hindu Code Bill. Uh, which uh, Nehru felt was being thwarted by the obstructionism of obscurantist Hindu elements. So he was naturally irritated by what he saw as their lack of willingness to embrace change and reform, even within the Hindu faith. As you know, eventually, the Hindu Code Bill did pass in 1956 as two or three bills rather than one, but it, it did get through, but it was a long struggle to get there. In fact, Ambedkar resigned from the cabinet on the issue of Nehru's failure, as he saw it, to push the Hindu code bill hard enough. Now, as far as an evidence of Nehru's um, connectedness, as it were, to the soul of India, I would only commend to you that wonderful document, The Will of Nehru. It is one of the most beautiful evocations. For example, when he talks about wanting his ashes to be scattered in the Ganga, the description of the Ganga as it rises from the Gangotri, as it descends from the Gangotri, um, uh, this mighty swollen, uh, swollen waters, broad-bosomed as the sea, and goes all the way down, all the way down to the Ganges Delta in Bengal. That vision of Nehru's is something which um, I think can not possibly have been articulated by someone completely disconnected from the from the past of India. Yes, he was a modern. Uh, figure in a very 20th century sense. 
the 20th century was in many ways a time in which a lot of people were seduced by uh, the attractions of, if you like, impatient transformation. Uh, Nehru visited the Soviet Union in the 1920s and was certainly taken in by, by what he was shown and, and, and he assumed that this was the way for the future and so on. Though he was too much of a Democrat to embrace communism, he nonetheless uh, was quite enamored of socialism, not just the socialism taught by Lasky at the London School of Economics, but also the socialism practiced as he saw it uh, in the Soviet Union. And these were all part of a certain mid-20th century or early mid-20th century sensibility, which many people outgrew with time. But the fact is that to be excited about modernity also translates into setting up the IITs and the IIMs. That happened in Nehru's watch. And that's very, very much a sort of non-Soviet kind of approach to creating institutions of scientific excellence in order to bring India into the 21st century. I'll concede, which up on the way, Nehru said that the, uh, at the inauguration, I think it was of the Bakranangal Dam, he said the dams and factories will be the new temples of modern India. He didn't give sufficient credence to the fact that the old temples would coexist side by side. And I've written about this some years ago in a column in the Hindu, where I recounted taking my mother to Puttaparthi, she's a big believer of Sai Baba's, and uh, chatting to people in the queue for the, the Basmam afterwards. And uh, uh, there was an Infosys engineer lining up to collect his sacred ash. And, and this contra, this, this paradox, if you like, is part of what India was that perhaps Nehru didn't give sufficient importance to. He did think in terms of it's either or. Either you're a worshipper, you go to temples, you believe in gurus and godmen, and you, you, you utter incantations, or you are a modern scientific man who will come up with, uh, with uh, uh, an appropriate approach to the, 20th, to the late 20th century. I agree that that was perhaps too stark a, a view of the world, and certainly we live in an India where both approaches coexist very comfortably. But I would argue that one, if one sees Nehru in the context of his time, in the context of global intellectual currents, those that shaped him as well as those that were shaping others around the world, it was rather unexceptional this respect for impatient modernity, but it was certainly, certainly not accompanied, as Chopin implied, with any disdain for the past, for Hindu culture, for ancient India's uh, extraordinary history, or indeed for the soul of the country as articulated in his will. I will say, though, that yes, he, he certainly wasn't uh, 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 terribly fond of certain political tendencies, and he felt that the nationalism or majoritarianism of the Hindu Mahasabha, Bharatiya Jansang and that ilk, today we know them as the Sang Parivar, that that kind of majoritarianism was actually a more dangerous form of secessionism because he felt that the secession of the majority from the nation itself was a bigger betrayal than a majority that was attentive to the interests, insecurities and needs of the minorities. Well, I, th I think that's a very important clarification which Shashi has made. And I think it's important in the context of what, again, Nehru's legacy as perceived by Nehruvians. And I think to a very large extent, Shashi is not a very typical Nehruvian in that sense, because he has a more nuanced understanding of the thing. And particularly important, and I would appreciate that, that he tries, to, that he has located Nehru within the context of the ideological fashions, if I may use that word, of the 1930s. Now, whether to a very large extent it was influenced by Lasky, or whether it was also a certain upper class English disdain for trade and uh, you know, commerce, is something which can be deb debated at length. Is that only upper class English, or is it also Brahminical in our uh, country? Well, but it, it is, and to a very large extent, Brahminical, some of the Brahminical responses were quite retrograde under the set. But the larger question of modernity, which you're talking about, and you were talking about modernity as that Nehru was very influenced by this entire notion of modernity, and therefore tended to bend the stick a bit in the other direction. But in India, and I think this is important to locate, the notions of modernity in the 1920s, in the 1930s, were very different. A, you had Gandhi, who was in many respects seriously anti-modern. 
Gandhi hated the railways, he hated the post office, he hated modern medicine. His Hind Swaraj is basically, you could say, a form of return to the, to return to sort of non-science. It was anti-science in some ways. There was that tradition. There was also the tradition of Tagore, which was against modernity of, uh, say, he equated modernity with extreme forms of nationalism. And there was that sort of then there were people like Madan Mohan Malviya who set up the Banaras in the university, which, who believed very strongly in how Japan was the inspiration and how Hindus could be remodeled in the vision of Japan, where science, modernity, and adherence to roots could be kept. So in India, the whole notion, the debate of modernity was a little different. And it perhaps goes only to show that to how strongly Nehru was actually influenced by European currents more than he was influenced by Indian currents. That Nehru was tremendously fond or had a great deal of appreciation for the heritage of India is, un is uncontested. Nehru loved the beauty. If you still go to Teen Murti house, where some of the old photographs, you'll find a lot of the old carvings were there, the photographs of there, some of the more exquisite works of art. Were thing. He personally ensured that the Ashokan pillar, uh, the uh, Ashok Stamba, which was there, which was removed from the, the mu in Indian Museum in Calcutta, without anyone's leave, by the way, uh, and put into Rashtrapati Bhavan. Uh, there was a difference. And I think that difference comes out very strongly in the Somnath issue. The issue of Somnath, the restoration of Somnath, for instance, Somnath, just as a background, was an important symbol to a lot of Hindus. Because for everybody, it was the sacking of Somnath by Mahmud of Ghazni, which had made a deep psychological impact and which people read about, and it was seen as the beginning of certain form of iconoclastic vandalism, which took place in it. So when the restoration of the Somnath temple, incidentally, funded quite a lot from government funds, approved by the cabinet of Jawaharlal Nehru, pushed through by K.M. Munshi and Sardar Patel, went through. The debate was about what do we do with the temple, I mean the restored temple. There were two also options. about the inauguration. Of the, 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 no, no, the, there were two options. One is you keep the temple, a restored temple, and give it to the ASI, Archaeological Survey. The second option was you install the Jyotir Ling there and make it into a living temple again. And here there were two different very sharp contrasting points of view. Nehru said, keep it, and he was encouraged by Maulana Azad, incidentally, in this way, said, keep it as an ASI sort of monument. While Sadar Patel and others said, no, this has to be a living thing. And I think this is fundamentally the difference which can be brought out between us. Nehru appreciated the art, the architecture, the ancient heritage of India, the history, while to him, it was not something which was living. And I think that's the difference. And I, Shashi, and I think you understand this, because you have become far more receptive to some of the traditions in Sabarimala than was expected. <laughs> and I think, and I'm glad of that. Touché. Because, because it is important. It's not a question that Nehru was against India. I think that's a very crude way of putting it. But if we are to make history real, live, vibrant, I think we must see that there were real differences. And these real differences are not between obscurantists and modernists, as some people would like to put it but differences in approach and these approach these differences still carry on now and there are important differences 
which must be respected. This I don't disagree with. Uh, Nehruji, actually, it went beyond his saying, uh, this question of it being kept as a monument. He actually opposed the president going to inaugurate it and requested Rajendra Prasad not to go. Uh, uh, but Rajendra Prasad said, no, I will go. And, and Nehru, in the end, gracefully had to accept that, just as in the cabinet debates on the funding. And it wasn't by any means the, the larger portion of the funding, but whatever was done, uh, Nehru was not terribly keen on spending large amounts of government money. He, in fact, he took the position that he had no problem with it being rebuilt as long as, you know, people paid for it themselves as a public thing. But in the end, the resources required needed some government money, and, and he acquiesced. The interesting thing is, you know, in a democracy, and Nehru was a profoundly convinced Democrat, as I argued earlier, you have to have this give and take. He articulated a point of view. Others articulated an opposite point of view. They prevailed, and the very fact that they prevailed shows you how much of a Democrat he was as this very powerful prime minister. And he made way, and he lived with it. He made his peace with it. And then Prasad went there, came back, there was no problem. And Prasad and he had such continued regard for each other, despite Chopin's again out of context quote, that it was Prasad who unilaterally and without consulting Nehru awarded him the Bharat Ratna in 1955. So let's be very clear that there was a, a great amount of mutual respect, but in a democracy, even within the same party or the same political tendency, there should be room for different perspectives, for reasonable engagement and discussion amongst them, and for a conclusion which sometimes one person may not like and a conclusion that sometimes the other person may not like. On this one, Indeed, the view that prevailed is the one that I think most Indians would be comfortable with today. I've been to Somnath. I would urge you all to go. It's one of the most beautiful temples in the country, exquisitely located right on the sea coast. And it's a terrific experience. And I'm very, very glad that has been revived and rebuilt uh, as an experience for Indians to share. But it do doesn't mean that there's such a thing as right or wrong. Nehru made his point of view clear. Others made their point of view clear. They got their way. I think that's a very good tribute to Nehru's attitude to democracy. <laughs> There's, of course, another facet of Nehru, which if you look at the debates on the First Amendment to the Indian Constitution, which happened, I think, barely about less than, just after a year after the Constitution was signed, which put certain restrictions on the freedom of speech, which actually said that if you criticize a foreign nation, you could be a friendly foreign country, you could be liable to prosecution, which contested the right of judicial review of the Supreme Court of India in certain matters of things. You know, issues which brought out another side of Nehru, and we could probably explain that there was a certain degree of impatience on the part of Nehru to push through land legislation, which was getting uh, bogged down by the courts. Uh, there was a certain impatience with the type of propaganda which he was felt he couldn't handle. So, even his credentials as a Democrat were no doubt impeccable, but there were moments when they too were under a lot of strain, and his legendary short temper is well known. In uh, when he went to Vishakhapatnam in 1951 or so to open the Vizag shipyards, which had been then set up by the Walchand group, Walchand Hirachand, they had set it up. And it was, you know, to those who say that Indian entrepreneurs lacked the initiative or the foresight and needed state intervention, should also look, look at the type of interventions they had made at that time. Uh, and he said, capitalists are only interested in blood sucking. I'm just quoting from memory at present. They're only interested in blood sucking. And that, you know, they, 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 and that this profit motive should be attacked. Now, you're opening the first Indian-owned, Indian-built shipbuilding yard in Vishakhapatnam, a source of great national pride. And all you can think of is that I don't like Walcham Hiratan. So that's another facet of Nehru, a certain degree of imperiousness which crept in. And I think that imperiousness is a, has become now a family legacy. Uh, <laughs> I just don't think that's fair and we're not uh, talking anyway, about we're, others. That's an aside, Shashi, and you don't protest too much. Uh, but uh, I, I think 
the point is Nehru was a Democrat. The culture, it's, it's understood, it's implicitly understood that you cannot run India as an autocracy. That you cannot run India as a totalitarian system. I certainly hope a that certain, those in power today will believe a that. A certain daughter of Nehru attempted that briefly and found to her cost that it doesn't work. Again, I don't know. I don't know whether that was a Nehruvian legacy or not, but no, it, wasn't. it wasn't. Let's put it that, that way. It wasn't. But all the same, I think Nehru's credential. Again, on the question of how much of free enterprise would be earned. Now, Nehru suddenly got into his head that we must have cooperative farming. It, of course, came to naught because there was just too much of fierce resistance. The Indian farmer has a certain degree of emotional attachment to his or her land. And that can't be taken away. And Nehru thought that was an irrational att attachment and we should have big collective farms. Rajaji opposed it bitterly. People like Charan Singh and others also came out of the Congress that way. So there were a lot of choices which Nehru wanted to exercise, which in hindsight, are inappropriate. I believe that the story of Indian entrepreneurship would have been little different if there hadn't been that institutional discouragement of free enterprise which Nehru initiated and which Indira Gandhi took to a ridiculous extreme. Okay, I, I don't actually disagree with Chopin on that particular point. I mean, I have some sympathy for Rajaji's critique of the license permit quota Raj, but I gave you the extenuating reasons why uh, that was built up in the process. But we have enough time for a few questions from the audience, Neeti. Well, I think that our two intellectuals, our two members of parliament have plenty of time to discuss elsewhere. I would also like to mention here that this festival, this international festival is powered by Bhima and Mr. Govindan is here from the Bhima group. Thank you for coming. And now shall we take questions from the audience? And thank now, you. yes, please. Anybody? Why don't you play traffic police? Uh, need, you, you choose the, you choose you the. Choose the. Um, this paradox between modernity and tradition, I think uh, dwells in every single individual. So, I mean, presently, the government, present government is uh, advocating a bullet train and seaplanes displacing crocodiles. So, uh, so that, uh, uh, I mean, why blame Nehru for uh, what he did? I think uh, as a small clarification, which doesn't distract from the larger seriousness of the question, is that the, the question of crocodiles was not about bullet trains, it's about Sardar Patel's statue, you know, there was a, it's, a, it's well, The crocodiles are now in the government, so it's on the ruling party. <laughs> which, which party? Somebody who can't speak says, sir, who is it addressed to? We probably both have a crack. I do think that you, your party, love very much abandoned Nehruvian rational thinking. Example, the drama your party was and is playing in the Shabari Mala gender issue. Madhu. Well, I think that's probably addressed to me. Uh, but if it's addressed to BJP, they are the guilty party because Congress is certainly not interested in drama. We have objected throughout to a sacred shrine being reduced to a stage for political theater. We are seeing vandalism, obstruction, violence, stone pelting, attacks on the police only from one party and it's not mine. So if it was addressed to me, let me say very clearly, we have moved away, if you like, from Nehruji's personally very strong disdain for religious practice, Malvis and mullahs and sadhus and sons, which he's actually said in those many words in one of his letters to a Muslim friend as it happens. But, um, but in that sense, it's, we have simply acknowledged the deep reality of the hold that religion and faith have in the lives of our fellow citizens for whose beliefs we have respect. That's essentially what we've done. But on the Shabrimala issue, while standing with the believers who feel personally violated, we have also said we will only pursue constitutional means, whether it's a review petition in the court, whether it's legislative action, we are not interested in street drama. 
So the drama that the questioner accuses us of can be laid at the door of only one party and it's not mine. Yes. Well, I'm glad at least Shashi has acknowledged that there was wisdom in religion. And that wisdom in religion is something which he is finally, he, albeit belatedly, in, in his old age, finally acknowledged. <laughs> All right. Excuse me, there are some Another. older people here. We take offense. <laughs> sir, we, same age. <laughs> some my question is to Shashidharu, sir. Sir, uh, Jawaharlal Nehru's critics are always vocal about the adverse effects of his idealism on Indian foreign policy, taking the examples of Indochina war, the Chettiar diaspora in Myanmar, and so on. So what is your take on it? Well, I mean, you know, Nehruji um, uh, has... As I said, he has a great deal to uh, be lauded for in terms of actually giving India a disproportionate influence on the world stage for at least a decade or decade and a, and, and, and a bit during his prime ministership. But there were definitely flaws in his vision. In my book, uh, Nehru, the Invention of India, I'm quite unsparing about the China policy because it, this did seem that he allowed himself to be deluded. And, and I say this... Uh, that he did so with the best of intentions. He genuinely saw way back, even before independence, China as the other great Asian civilization oppressed by colonial and imperial forces. Uh, when he held the, uh, the, the famous Asian relations conference in 1946 as prime minister of the interim government, uh, before India had won independence, he made it a point to invite the, the Chinese, the Chiang Kai-shek's government at that point to be represented. He really saw common cause, and as a result, it did lead him to acquiesce very tamely in the Chinese takeover of Tibet, but not just to acquiesce in it, to withdraw the Indian presence from Tibet. We had legations and military posts in three, four places, which we pulled out uh, over the objections of Sadar Patel and others. And then subsequently, his sort of patronage of the Chinese communist-led government uh, introducing them to other world leaders at Bandung, providing an air India aircraft for them to fly them out of Beijing when other countries' airlines are not prepared to go there. All these sorts of things, um, which he saw as very benign and supportive and friendly, were seen by the Chinese, I'm afraid, as patronizing, and they were looking for an opportunity to put him in his place. May I just uh, add, uh, one I, of these. Yeah, you just add to that. I, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we're heading. We're talking in Trivandrum. Um, there were two. Un Two gentlemen from Kerala who are most responsible for the disastrous foreign policy as far as China is concerned. One was Sardar Patel, who Sir Girija Shankar Bajpai used to say acted more as a representative of China rather than as India's ambassador. Sardar and, Panikar, you mean? Yes, Panikar. And secondly was Krishna Menon, who, whose sense, who gave Nehru a false sense of defense preparedness and allowed him to go for a disastrous forward policy at that time. But one thing which I think is very important is that Nehru was regarded in international circles as a bit of a bore. The reason for it is not because as an individual he was not appreciated, but because the grandiose pronouncements of India were far disproportionate to its lack of internal capacity. So internal capacity first, preached to the world later, is what we've subsequently realized. And that Nehru didn't. He jumped the gun. As a result, we had to lead. We, had to, we could denounce American policy, but we had to beg them for their wheat. And we had to leave what, what is called a ship to mouth demeaning existence. Now look, I don't entirely disagree with the latter part of that, but the, the, the idea that wonder, he was... What do you disagree with me? No, We've no. agreed on everything to today. Not everything. Not everything. No, no. <laughs> may, but may, but, may but, but, but I, I do disagree that uh, with your apart statement from, that he was regarded a, as a bore. He was actually considered one of the most scintillating intellects on the world stage. He was apparently a great dinner companion. Yeah, he had yes, a wonderful he way with imitation of, uh, of other people's voices and accents. He was very popular. And John F. Kennedy wrote that he was the world leader he was most anxious to meet, most keen on meeting. It, later, it's true that he also said it was the most disappointing visit he'd ever had from yeah. a foreign leader because by then, Nehru in the post-China war phase was a broken man. But the earlier Nehru was certainly not seen as a bore. Yeah, well, when he now died, and there, was an obituary, there was an obituary meeting for him 
in Trinity College, Cambridge, I think, I forget it was, I think it was Mountbatten or Rab Butler who went up and said, after all, he was one of us. And I think that's really sometimes the issue here. The Nehru was too much of one of us there and not enough of one of us here. Uh, <laughs> this question is to Swapan. Uh, I guess uh, Malbubi made a mistake uh, in terms of the title. Uh, the title being What Did Nehru Do Right? And I guess in the whole discussion, we are picking on minor flaws of Nehru at this point in time. And again, 70 years later, if we are looking back at Nehru and his relevance, okay, I guess the question uh, probably 20 years from now would have been, what did Modi do right? Uh, because the number of things that, that we are trying to pick, which is very small and mi minor, and I guess uh, your agreements and disagreements are on very trivial, smaller things, as opposed to, uh, I mean, uh, how the present regime is dismissive of Nehru, and you are also talking about uh, what you call looking at the past, uh, trying to erase things, new India. I guess the focus again is now uh, what I call uh, emphasis on new India and with scanned respect for history or what has happened in the past. No, I, I, I think you may be right in saying that there is an assault on what might loosely be called the Nehruvian tradition. And I think throughout our conversation it became quite clear that there is a sharp difference between what is Nehru, the individual, the man who was prime minister from 47 to 64, and what the Nehruvian tradition has come to mean. And I believe, and I sincerely believe, that the Nehruvian tradition has to led to a certain distorted form of thinking, which needs to be set out. Now, in the hurly-burly of politics, where polemical exaggeration is natural, there is obviously a thing to overstate the case. And that happens. And I mean, I, I, I mean, there's, we all know that. I mean, if you, I mean, Shashi overstates the case and gets into trouble over tweets. Now, others get intellectuals like you most worked up. I think that's part of the game. Let's not get it. Modi has a definite perspective. There is a definite perspective of modernity, of modernization, which they have, and there's a different one which someone else has. And I think these are real differences, and these are being fought over at a different way. Now, what the level of the rhetoric is going to be, how the, what the intellectual standards of the discourse is going to be, is not for me and you to de determine. It sometimes does go into rather base levels. Okay, on the question of what did Modi do right or wrong, I think you'll please come at 4 o'clock to the discussion on the paradoxical prime minister, and you'll hear my view on that. But on what Chopin basically said, I think that this, um, he, he has expressed in very reasonable terms, uh, but uh, an analysis which is profoundly troubling. Because as I said at the very beginning, and I realized half the audience wasn't there yet, the fundamental pillars that Nehru left behind are indeed these principles of democracy, of secularism or pluralism, of, uh, of uh, an economics what that worries the, about social justice. What about justice the socialism part? About, yeah. What about the socialism part which was inserted into the preamble? So as I said, socialism understood in the context of the times and as a concern for social justice. But socialism in terms of state capitalism, I happen to also think was the license permit quota Raj was not a success. And then finally, the, the, the place in the world that you talk about. But what we are all losing sight of is that that worldview that Chopin is so blithely discarding, actually was a worldview anchored in a tremendous pride in all that India could be. And I literally mean all. I mean, this is a place, Tiruvananthapuram, where you are, this building is standing between a statue of Swami Vivekananda and another distinguished Bengali on the other side, Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose. This is, this is the kind of India that we were all encouraged to build, where our respect, our heroes, our, uh, our affection goes beyond boundaries of region, caste, creed, language, and embraces a much more expansive, capacious version of a plural India. Uh, and at the same time, here in Kanakunda on the grounds, we have an Indian flag flying that I had something to do with installing here, which is the highest flag in southern India. Now, this is all part of an Indian pride, which manifests itself very differently from the majoritarian chauvinism of those who rule us today. It is pride in variety. It is pride in pluralism. It is pride in the acceptance of difference, as Swami Vivekananda spoke about. It is not pride in one narrow sectarian, narrow, uh, sorry, petty view 
of Indianness, which I think Nehru would definitely have repudiated. My question is to Das Gupta Sal. Uh, Sal, uh, who are the persons placing unhealthy patriotism and unhealthy nationalism now and the past, according to your view? Well, that's a quite a fascinating question. You know, what is an what is healthy and unhealthy nationalism? Uh, Muhammad Ali Jinnah was a nationalist at one time. I mean, there's a there's a hall in Bombay which is devoted to Jinnah as the architect of Hindu-Muslim unity. He was horrified at the idea of masses coming into politics, which is why he broke with Mahatma Gandhi at that particular point. Mahatma. He was a nationalist who went all right. There are very large parts of Savarkar, which I profoundly disagree with. Savarkar was a patriot. He was a great believer. He was a person who actually tried to put a degree of rationalism into Hindu nationalism. Rationalism into Hindu nationalism. So he had his contributions. Was Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose wrong? when he decided that he must team up with the Axis Pass. And Nehru at that time said, I will fight to prevent Netaji ever coming in with the Axis Pass here. There were sharp disagreements on that. Who is healthy, who is unhealthy is a very difficult one to say. It is not for me to question patriotism of anybody in this case. Would I say Jyoti Basu? was unpatriotic when he, in 1962, he says, I hear there's a war going on in the Himalayas, but socialists don't attack other countries. Were the communists unpatriotic in 1947 when they said, azadi hai. this is a flawed independence? These are historical things, evolution of things which happen, which people get right. Today, Sitaram Yachuri swears by the constitution. They were the bitterest critique of this constitution, of the constituent assembly, etc. They, dis they disavowed everything. So, you know, like Shashi very glibly pointed out, that only one side believes in the plurality, the grandeur, the majesty, the diversity of India. Now that is the type of arrogance, which to my mind is really offensive. To believe that my patriotism is better than your patriotism. My patriotism that my, doesn't exclude. That my cosmopolitanism is much superior to your narrow nationalism, which is the rhetoric they use. The fact that we are liberals and you are anti-enlightenment. I, Incidentally, I proudly say I'm anti-enlightenment. That entire tradition. So, if he can point out the statues on this ground, when I can say that go to Kashmir, go to the Amarnath Caves, the chief priest there for centuries has been an Ambudri Brahmin from Kerala. Since there is a Adi unity Shankar. of India with the Adi Shankaracharya also. Okay. We must look upon it. So there is a natural unity of India which is also there, which came about before the constitution was promulgated, life did not start on 26 January 1950. Constitution laid down certain rules of the game of how we must conduct public life. But the essence of nationhood goes much deeper. And recognize that, he does recognize that. And that's where the whole difference is. Actually, I believe this is not really a major difference. When asked, and, and to today the problem is that the intellectual consensus in India, intellectual consensus, not the popular consensus, the intellectual consensus has veered so sharply to, to the left and has become, you know, things like postmodernism and all that sort of stuff, that it has created schisms in public life which should not exist. So much as you know, we would like, I don't one, know. One last sentence, just to say that I actually think that what, what Chopin said towards the end was an affirmation of the Nehruvian view of India, yeah, which is precisely that 
precise, you know, when, when Italy was created in the late 19th century out of a mosaic of principalities and statelets, an Italian nationalist writer, Massimo Taparelli D'Azeglio, rather memorably wrote, we have created Italy, now we must create Italians. Now, Nehru would never have thought it necessary to write a sentence like that, because he believed in the existence of India and Indians for millennia before the modern nationalist movement gave contemporary 20th century expression to their longings for freedom. For the reassertion, as he put it in his Tristwood Destiny speech, of what was always existed but had been long suppressed. So that is the vision that Chopin has just articulated. Very different from the vision of the people whom I will not name who are in power today are in the ruling establishment who actually want to have a nationalism that excludes very many and interpret and reinterpret this Indian heritage in very narrow terms. We'll probably have to pick up the threads elsewhere, but I did want yeah, to sure. say that there <laughs> I you agree. Wanted to, you wanted to have the last word, Beast. Always, yeah, always. That's not the point here. <laughs> so may I thank I think you? What we'll do is we'll agree that we vote differently but still, there is a very large degree of common ground which we can still have a common civilized discourse. And I think that's the important thing in India, that we should continue this dialogue. This is not a war. This is a dialogue. That's a good last word. <laughs>